I'm Janet Hoskins. I'm a professor at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, I'm an anthropologist, but at this point I also have an affiliation with the religion department. I've been interested in doing research on religions in Vietnam since roughly the beginning of the 21st century. I like to mark it kind of with that turn of the century. And um, in particular, I've been interested in this new religion called Caudaism which I discovered, in fact, in California because they, had, they were building temples very close to where I grew up. Um, but then I followed it to Vietnam. I've, at this point, visited Khao Dai temples in a number of other countries, including France and Australia. It's a, an important and relatively large new religion that very few people have heard of. It's clear that there was spirit writing in the 19th century at a time when it was also very popular in China. The first published morality book was 1834. Um, this is based on the search of the historian Liam Kelly, who argues that Le Quy Don, who's a famous Vietnamese historian, there are many streets named after him in um, Ho Chi Minh City and in Hanoi. He published a book um, which was a guide to what he calls the hidden administration. And uh, this seems to have been, he argues, uh, based on spirit writing. There also have been a series of other morality books published, lots of them near the end of the 19th century. Um, and it obviously became a popular genre when you first developed large-scale printing in uh, Romanized Vietnamese, the Quoc Mu, which is the uh, Vietnamese language written with uh, Roman characters. It seems that it came in through these communities which are called the Ming Hương, uh, Ming is actually a reference not just to enlightenment, which of course it also means, but also to the Ming refugees who started coming particularly into southern Vietnam in the 1600s. Um, and they were an important population, uh, especially in the former Saigon. There's still a large Chinatown in Saigon, which is called Cholon. It means big market. And the Ming Hung are called Ming Hung because they intermarried. So the Ming are, are Chinese, Hung is a Vietnamese first name, um, it means fragrance or perfume. And so the mixture of the Ming refugees and the, the local women created a population with some Chinese ancestry. Um, probably for many people, it was only a quarter or, or less, but um, there was obviously an influence of Chinese literary culture that went much further than, than simply the ancestry. Kaodaism basically emerged at the same time as the Vietnamese nationalist movement. Um, the first seances were held in 1925, which was the year when there was a huge funeral for a Vietnamese nationalist who died, and, there, and it was obvious that this had become a massive movement. The religion was officially inaugurated in November 1926, um, and in some ways, initially, French colonial officers claimed that it was a, a political movement masquerading as a religion because it was a religion that presented itself as identifying the Vietnamese people as the chosen people, using this sort of biblical metaphor. Uh, they were chosen because they had suffered under the yoke of colonialism more than any other people within the East Asian civilization area. And of course there was like the Koreans were colonized by the Japanese, but that doesn't, that weren't, they weren't Europeans. So from their point of view, the Vietnamese, because they had su uniquely suffered under the yoke of European colonialism, they would then be rewarded for their virtue with the chance to become the people who would lead the rest of the world in uniting world religions and finding a pathway to, to salvation. So it was a very specific nationalist method, message that had a political content and was linked to prophecies that the, the age of European colonization was coming to an end. And that made it, of course, politically suspect, but there's a strategic, there was a strong strategic ex advantage to being a religion under a colonial power such as France. France is an extremely secularized society, so the freedom of religion is very important. 
Uh, French colonial officers had no problem in suppressing political movements, but they, they hesitated uh, because of this idea of the rights of man and so forth. They hesitated in suppressing something that presented itself as a religion. So I, I don't believe this was just an artifice. I, of course, do believe that, that Caudais did really believe their teachings, but it, it is true that there was a strategic advantage um, in presenting an, a nationalist message to present that within the format of a religious movement as opposed to simply a political one. Well, Caudaism came into being as, um, with the idea that it would bring together all different religions. It was based, the first message where um, the supreme being, who was called Caudai, the, the highest tower, um, identified himself as the supreme being was on Christmas Eve, 1925. And that's significant because he also identified himself as Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament. So from the Kaudai point of view, Jesus was the son of the Jade Emperor. Kaudai. Kaudai is another name for the Jade Emperor. And therefore, the Jade Emperor, from their perspective, sent Buddha, Confucius, Lao Tzu, and also Jesus uh, into this world. And so Christianity is sort of encompassed within this broader East Asian cosmology. Um, so it was a, a way of universalizing religion, which, however, to a certain extent, privileged the insights of the East Asian philosophical masters and included Christianity, um, but didn't give it a, a position of priority. This was, as most people have argued, a response to European colonialism, um, but also a way of turning the tables on it, quite literally, uh, because it was giving greater importance to the great teachings of the Asian masters and saying that they were compatible with the messages of Christianity, which have to do with brotherly love and understanding and so forth, but um, did not credit those teachings as being superior, of course, which is the perspective of the Catholic missionaries. So it made it, although they saw this as generous and tolerant, um, from the perspective of the Catholic church, this was blasphemous and awful, you know, and in a large, for a largely secular French colonial administration, a great many of the, the um, colonial officers were in fact Freemasons. Some of them were simply curious about this new religion. They found it intriguing that it incorporated a lot of symbols that we do associate with Freemasonry as well, including the, the eye within the triangle. But it was also seen as bizarre, incomprehensible, a strange mixture of different elements, a Russian salad religion, so there were a variety of different reactions to it. You know. Specifically, um, the very first mediums had started experimenting with European forms of spiritism, particularly table tipping, which is something that was used by Victor Hugo um, in 1935 on the island of Jersey when he had a series of spirit revelations. And uh, Hugo's, the transcripts of his spirit seances were not published until well after he died in, 19, in 1885, they were published in 1923, so many years after his death. And then they were read by a younger generation of, of Vietnamese intellectuals who were already experimenting with certain forms of spirit writing. So these first mediums used basically a, quote, French method, and they were reading people like Alain Kardec, Le Livre des Esprits, who wrote a sort of manual for um, French spiritism. So they started with a European method, they were then instructed by this cultivated spirit that they started conversing with. Uh, initially, he was called a a -E, which is the first three letters of the Vietnamese alphabet, three forms of the letter A, basically, with different tones. Um, and then this highly cultivated spirit eventually revealed himself to be Khao Dai, the supreme being, and told them, it's very slow to do table tipping. You don't want to do this. It's not a good method. What you should do is go borrow a phoenix basket from Ming Le Dao, which was one of the the redemptive societies operating in uh, Saigon at that time, and use that because this will be a superior method. So it's very interesting that they, were, they came into this through practicing basically a, a French spiritist technology of spiritism, and then they were encouraged to go back to an older Asian technology, which would be the superior technology. The techniques again came from this Ming Hung group, uh, and these groups had, it's very clear, been practicing uh, spirit writing for some time. Um, and 
they used a device that, the, the most important device that they used is this device called the Ngokke, which is a, a phoenix basket. And so it's about the size of a violin. It has um, a round basket on one end, and then it has a sculpted head of a phoenix at the head with a beak. In the beak, you can put a little stick of incense, and there's a, a writing implement that can be put in there too. And so this is held by either one or two different spirit mediums, and it will strike the table, and then will trace out words written. Uh, importantly, this is the f these are the first revelations received in Romanized Vietnamese, in the quote ngu. So rather than tracing out a character, which of course is, is what you happen, had with all the Chinese examples, they were writing in cursive in uh, Romanized Vietnamese with a series of different diacritics, and it was therefore easy, even seamless, to also stick in a few French words, even a few English words. It made the bilingualism, which was a characteristic of Kadaism, possible using the technology of Phoenix basket writing. Uh, they did also use a number of other somewhat lower ranking implements. Um, there was a, a planchette, an alphabetic planchette, much more like what we know as a Ouija board. Um, and there were occasionally people who received revelations simply directly into, into the brush or into the pen. But um, for scripture, for the actual revelations that, that became the basis of this religion, almost all of them were revealed with the Phoenix basket. Kadaism was always very connected to political agendas. When it first emerged in the 1920s, it was there many. It was there was a lot of surveillance by the French secret police, by the Sûreté. We know a lot of the history of Kadaism, as a matter of fact, from these reports filed by uh, secret agents who were writing for the French secret police. Um, but it also had its defenders. And so, for instance, at the time of the International Exposition in Paris in 1931. Um, there was one of the Kadai leaders, uh, Trang Quang Ving, had a meeting uh, where he spoke to people who defending the rights of man. He got basically a committee of supporters, uh, many of them Freemasons within France, who argued that the new movement should be tolerated in the spirit of French humanitarianism and so forth. So there was a division between people who were fearful of it. Um, I found, among other things, in, in French archives, I know this could be another typing, you know. So the French were very familiar with the danger of new religions and the fact that this could provoke huge wars that would, that would kill thousands of people or even millions. So there was, there was both a fear of what this kind of new religion could bring and for some people, they were intrigued, they wanted to experiment with it. In the 1930s, um, a number of French people were actually invited to come to Kaudai seances, and sometimes to ask questions, sometimes to participate. So they, they made a kind of propaganda effort to, to have supporters as well as detractors. Um, and this worked reasonably well through the 30s. You had a leftist government coming in, Le Front Populaire, um, in the late 1930s, um, but then, as World War II sort of came closer, there were predictions um, within the Kaudai spirit messages that Japan's power would help to bring down European colonial empires. And this was seen as, as treason by French rulers. So thousands of Kaudai uh, leaders were arrested. Um, the very most important ones were sent into exile off the coast of Africa. Um, and there was a rather heavy repression just before the Japanese invasion. Uh, when the Japanese initially invaded, they, they left the French colonial government in place, and they simply sort of ruled indirectly through this colonial government. In March 1945, they decided to actually overthrow the French, and at that time, they had a Kaudai militia, which was trained by the Japanese and helped them to overthrow the French. So um, Kaudais were literally the assistants of the Japanese in, in that early effort at overthrowing the French. Um, when the French then wanted to come back in, after the end of World War II, 1946, they then had to find some local allies and it became very clear that the strongest leader of the nationalist movement was Ho Chi Minh. So they looked for people who had suffered um, and turned away from the communist leadership. And these people were the people like Cao Dais who had uh, clashed violently with communist forces and um, off 
in fact been massacred in a number of different places. So because there had been these violent encounters between different nationalist forces within Vietnam, Cao Dai's, who had initially literally assisted in getting rid of the French, were recruited to become allies of uh, what they called a nonviolent transfer of power. So the most prominent Cao Dai leader at the time, who was called the Ho Fap, the defender of the Dharma, he presented himself as following in the steps of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, he said, we want independence for Vietnam, but we want to follow an independent, pa uh, nonviolent pathway. We reject the um, warlike attributes of the, the resistance led by Ho Chi Minh, and we want a negotiated um, independence that might even, at that time it was possible, it might include a remaining part of what was called um, a, the French Union, Union Francaise, which was intended to be something like the British Commonwealth. That didn't come to pass. Um, but that was, there was an idea that it was possible, it might be possible to have a nonviolent transfer of power with still some kind of continuing link to French civilization and uh, French history, but, but more political autonomy. Karazim was based primarily in the South, and there are like 1,332 Kaudai temples, of which um, only seven of them are in the north. You know, there are two in Hanoi and a couple of others sprinkled around. But the other, all, all the others are in what people usually call the center in the south, but the border between north and south Vietnam at, during the period of the Vietnam War um, included the center, meaning the area with Da Nang, Hue, so forth, in the Republic of Southern Vietnam. There had been actually Cao Dai participation in a number of governments. There was a Cao Dai prime minister, another president, briefly. There were a lot of different governments at that time. But, but Cao Dai's were um, invested in the South Vietnamese cause in a lot of important ways. And of course, a number of them were, were drafted and served as high-ranking military officers and so forth. So at the time that Saigon fell, um, it was very clear that this would not be good for Kandaism. A lot of younger people fled at that time. Uh, they were among the boat people. They're among people who flew, who flew out at the very last minute. Those who remained um, saw the religion pretty much closed down for a quarter century. Um, a lot of temples were quite literally boarded up. They, they weren't destroyed, you know, they were not burned, um, but they were boarded up, almost no one went in them for a great many years. Um, a few others were allowed some sort of very low level of, of operation, but uh, in the largest Kaudai center, which was Tainin, out of 65 religious buildings, 63 were closed. <laughs> Uh, and they were often used for re-education classes where people were, were basically taught Marxist um, theory and uh, re-educated to become citizens of a socialist Vietnam. A very large number of people who had had some connection to the military or to um, American social services, hospitals, whatever, were imprisoned in what were called re-education camps. Um, and so... For, for really a quarter of a century, there was virtually no activity within Cao Dai temples. What that has meant for the Cao Dai's who chose to go overseas, um, some of them living as early as 1975, some of them as late as, as the 1990s, they felt they had to rebuild their religion in the new countries that they moved to. Now, the largest number moved to the United States. There were significant populations in Australia, in Canada, and in France. And so today, there are Cao Dai temples in all of those countries. Um, interestingly enough, because of this loss of country, which was so devastating, um, there also was a kind of apocalyptic sense that, that this was certainly as bad as the crisis of colonization in, in 1925. And there were a number of spirit mediums who opened new temples and received new spirit messages that would guide this population of refugees. And once again, it was an argument that Cao Dais, because of their special history at the intersection of all these different religions, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, as well as Catholicism and Spiritism and Theosophy to some extent, would be able to lead a unification of new religions in the new world and would be able to even integrate certain American religious figures um, like specifically Joseph Smith, who was the founder of Mormonism. Mormonism has this sort of sprinkling of 
symbols taken from Freemasonry that you also have in Chaldaism. So it was seen as a, it is in many ways a kindred religion. It's a new religion born in the United States um, in the 19th century. And it shares some symbolic language and so forth with the, the new religion of Chaldaism. So that was something that Chaldaists discovered on their arrival in the United States. There were also some of these diasporic Chaldaists who were practicing spirit writing. Um, the most active center was the temple called Tianli Butoa, which is, was originally in San Jose, California. There was also a circle of um, spirit writing uh, practitioners in the Los Angeles area. And in particular, I made contact with Han Bui, who was someone who came from Da Nang, from central Vietnam. Um, and he had attended spirit writing seances in Saigon and in Da Nang. Uh, when he was living in Vietnam. When he came to the United States, uh, he made contact with this group in Los Angeles and practiced with them. But he had moved, they were, they're a very secretive group. And to tell you the truth, I've never been able to attend their spirit writing seances. Um, you have to be initiated. You have to get the approval of the gods from a Sinkeo, a divination ceremony. I have been able to visit the, the temple, uh, Tianli Butoa, uh, which they are very open about their spirit writing, and as a matter of fact, they've put, they have a very active website. And so they've published what they call five or six new volumes of the Kaodai Bible as um, what you might call morality books that are published primarily online from this temple in San Jose. The group in Los Angeles, he had sort of broken off from, was practicing more independently with a group of other people who were also part of this esoteric Chiu Min uh, Khao Dai group. And he allowed me to attend uh, some of their seances. I was also invited by some of the women who practice in a somewhat different tradition to come to see their altars and, and see the, the somewhat different way in which they practice. But so this is the group where I was eventually able to, to film a, a spirit writing session. And he was also willing to share. He had a notebook full of messages that he'd received over a period of roughly a decade. And he shared some of those messages with me. The Phoenix writing instrument that my friend Ham Bui used was something he had made for him in Vietnam. And it's made out of peach wood, which of course is important in um, um, evoking the peach immortality and various other things in, in Chinese religious mythology. He had it made on the model of a number of phoenix baskets that were in use in Mingling Dao and, and various other Vietnamese temples, um, particularly those known for divination and things like spirit writing and occultism. So he had this particular instrument. He brought it from Vietnam and was using it uh, with a number of his uh, colleagues in this spirit writing circle in Los Angeles. His account of it was surprising to me in certain respects. I had somehow, you know, from the sort of contemplative esoteric tradition, I'd expected something calmer, you know, sort of people went into deep meditation and there was a little bit of movement. And I found something very dramatic, you know, where you really see the, the phoenix take flight in certain ways. You can imagine this bird turning, this bird lift, lifting its head up, going down. Um, and, and the rapping on the table, of course, is, is very abrupt and uh, even harsh at particular moments. Um, sometimes it's correcting something. And so this dramatic presentation I found um, appealing and perhaps more dramatic than some of the examples we've seen from contemporary Taiwan and so forth, where people are just kind of holding a, a Y-shaped or T-shaped device and um, tracing the figures in sand. Uh, of course, the, the big difference between all of the Kaodai techniques and the, the ones in um, Taiwan and, and other Chinese groups is you're not tracing characters. You are using this alphabetic script, which uh, operate somewhat differently. Khambui himself has a practice, which is the same practice as that of Lian Hua, a very famous medium who received most of this scripture, um, the esoteric scripture that has been most important for Kaodais. And um, there are also others where you would have two mediums working together with someone else reading the message. When the medium himself is not speaking or herself is not speaking, then um, the role of the reader who interprets that message 
and says it or writes it down, I think is tremendously important. And so for almost all of these things, one, one way in which people buy into the process is it isn't simply one person alone saying, I heard this message from divine sources. It involves a, a kind of team of at minimum four people, often more, and everyone in attendance at the seance is in a sense participating in this moment of revelation. So I think that explains a group dynamic, which also gives, explains why people come to believe in these particular practices. It's not dependent on the charisma simply of the individual who received it, but it itself is a sort of engine for creating an impression of a legitimate religious inspiration. Kambui, a Jiuming disciple who practices as a private medium for his own personal spiritual development, allow us to tap a seance. I was born as a Kaudai. My father was a Kaudai. But I was born uh, in the fam Kaudai family and I went to school uh, at the Kaudai uh, temple. I think in my mind, I kind of uh, more of a truth seeker than an advocate for a belief. I sincerely study about Kaudai, but in a sense of learning and exploring. Before you start, you hold the basket, and then you look up to the eye, the single eye on the picture, and then you hold that picture. We use that kind of like a focal point to hold our mind to it. you feel like it's kind of a drug, and then you start moving. The urge of moving just come. And the hands move on its own, and then I just follow. And it moves so strong. It moves a lot, it moves very strongly. I was like a, an observer. It's completely uh, conscious in a, in a very deep concentration. You kind of focus. Almost the mind go blank. It looks like uh, after it uh, gets the coordination between the energy and our own energy, and then it goes smoothly. The messages come in the form of four stanza poems tapped onto the tabletop by the phoenix basket. It's all about the moving of the, the hands, the arms, and then uh, mentally see what uh, words was written and, and I read that out loud so it can be recorded. Somehow the, the meaning of the word form in, the, in my mind and then spoken out almost like spontaneously. Khambui keeps transcriptions of the messages he has received. If you have experience of meditation for some time, probably it will set your mind in a condition in which you will allow the energy to function better. To learn and understand the true mediumship in Kaudai is not only receiving the message, the teaching, but also receiving the, the energy itself to help with your uh, practice, with your cultivation. Okay, coming back to Vietnam, in 1975, um, this particular kind of literary spirit writing was outlawed as part of a series of laws against superstition, against wasteful religious practices, and so forth. In 1976, the most important Kaodai leaders, including the spirit mediums in Tainan, this 
Center for Kardaism where they were asked to sign statements that messages came from men, they did not come from gods, and, and therefore they acknowledged that this was basically a false method. However, since the liberalization of a number of laws about religion, um, it has been true that um, certain forms of trans spirit possession are now extremely common in Vietnam. So there is now a very popular practice of spirit possession, particularly in venerating mother goddesses, uh, that has emerged particularly in northern Vietnam, but has also spread to the south. And this has now been recognized as of November 2011 as an intangible cultural heritage of Vietnam. So it is now treated as, as a very respected and revered part of Vietnamese folklore. However, this is a practice that involves dressing up in costumes, it involves dancing, it doesn't involve producing texts. The closest they get to producing texts is you'll see someone kind of uh, taking pieces of yellow paper and scratching at them with a red marker as a sign of an official approving documents, but there's nothing intelligible that comes out of it. So the fact that this is now legal and even celebrated in Vietnam opens a window of possibility for uh, the country eventually to move towards legalizing this other form of spirit writing that was associated with a communist leadership, a, a suspect practice. Um, I think it certainly is true that there are spirit writing seances that happen in Vietnam. This is a sort of open secret. They cannot happen in the official spaces that were designated for them in the great temples. They probably do happen in people's homes. And there are messages that circulate on the internet, often without a date, often without a location, um, but that are obviously proof that, that some people are at least experimenting with this within Vietnam as they are out, outside Vietnam. And of course, sometimes it, people will, it will be unclear where, whether a spirit message was received within Vietnam or outside of it. But there may well be a move towards a full normalization in which they would once again allow people to have these seances within the temples. Uh, were they to do that, I'm very sure that there would be a lot of self-censorship and, and the people managing these seances would make it, would be very careful that they did not have political content that would be considered inappropriate by the political authorities.